Hello and welcome to the History of Modern Greece. I'm your host, Daniel Roberts, and I'm here with my father, George, and our theme music is brought to you by Mark Youngerman. This is a podcast that covers the events from the fall of ancient Greece to the modern day. This is episode 28, Justinian the Great. On August 1st, 527, Justin died, and his nephew Justinian was crowned emperor of the Eastern Roman Empire. I'll try my best not to prop Justinian up too much, but you should know that he is my favorite emperor in Byzantine history, and probably in my top three of all-time Roman emperors. Justinian had many accomplishments, ranging from forming legal codes, retaking the western provinces, including Rome itself and North Africa, but he also commissioned many great building projects, and some of them still survive today. He started his life in the Balkans and fled to Constantinople as a refugee, just like his uncle had before him. And because of his uncle's connections in the city, Justinian was able to obtain a first-class education. And even though his mother tongue was Latin, Justinian spoke really good Greek, excellent Greek. When he came to the golden city of Constantinople, he became heavily involved in chariot racing. And he was a particularly a big fan of the blues. Chariot racing in Constantinople dates back to the dawn of the Roman Empire. And the stadium in Constantinople meant that the people could watch chariot racing, one of the most dangerous sports in history. Most people showed up to the games knowing that they were going to watch someone die. Picture NASCAR racing, except it is the only sport that exists. And all the hype from the Super Bowl, NHL Stanley Cup, and World Cup FIFA, all wrapped up into a single sport. Now imagine there are only two teams, the Blues and the Greens. Well, actually there were two minor teams as well, the Reds and Whites. When people support a team, it went way beyond anything we can comprehend today. Their fans were fanatics, pun intended. Riots often broke out between Greens and Blues in the streets of Constantinople, in which people were commonly killed. Due to the establishment of Christianity as a state religion, most of the sports we think of taking place in a Roman stadium were banned. But chariot racing remained the primary sport of the empire. And when times were tough in the empire, as they had been at this point, the races were a way of distracting the people from their troubles. Just like his uncle... Justinian was a staunch Orthodox Christian, which meant he was a Nicene Christian that believed Jesus was a man as well as a god at the same time. To really understand Christianity and all its details, I really recommend the History of the Papacy podcast by Stephen Guerra. It'll go into a lot more depth than what we're about to cover. While attending the theater, Justinian met a beautiful young lady named Theodora. She was born around 500 in either Crete or Syria, and was even lower on the social ladder than the young peasant Justinian. Her father was a bear trainer in a circus on the fringes of the empire, and after he died she most likely worked as a prostitute and a stage actress, a profession that was itself almost synonymous. In 516, however, Theodore moved to Egypt and became a devoutly religious woman, abandoning her former career. She later moved to Constantinople and was working as a wool spinner when, at some point in 522, she caught Justinian's eye. We don't know for sure if Theodora was a prostitute, but she was definitely associated with them. However, this didn't stop Justinian from falling madly in love with her. They had quite a beautiful story, actually, and it's partly why I love Justinian so much. At the time, Justinian was a senator, and it was forbidden for senators to marry actresses. He used his power and influence to rewrite Roman law to allow for senators to marry actresses, as long as they have been reformed. Theodora was a strong woman and very intelligent, and despite her being a monophysite and him being a diophysite, they managed to make it work, and Justinian's love for her allowed him to see the monophysites in his empire with a more tolerant perspective. 
Monophysite Christians and Diophysite Christians are extremely different from each other. If you think Protestants and Catholics are different religions, then you will be astonished at this. Monophysites believe that Jesus could not be a human and the divine Son of God. Jesus was divine only, and that roughly translated into Jesus was a God. Whereas the Diophysites believed that Jesus was both human and divine at the same time. Complicated, I know. And to think that Arianism was a different form of Christianity practiced by North Africans and the German barbarians who conquered Rome only a few generations ago. Every single denomination of Christianity that is around today, from Mormon, Catholic, to Baptist and Lutheran, are all Diophysite. Justinian married Theodora and promoted her to empress the same day he was crowned emperor. She was his co-ruler of the Roman Empire. This move was unprecedented and did not sit well with the aristocracy of, in Constantinople. Justinian and Theodora were outsiders, peasants and prostitutes. They were very unpopular at first. They were both very intelligent and worked together as equals to build their legacy into the Roman Empire by reconquering the lost Western Empire and building massive structures in the Empire. They wanted to make the Roman Empire great again. And they also needed lots of gold power and influence to make this dream a reality. These ambitions required a special entourage of people. Probably the second greatest person in Justinian's entourage after Empress Theodora was his general, Belisarius. He was also from the Balkans and had a similar background to Justinian. What made Belisarius stand out to Justinian was his brilliant idea in modernizing their warfare. He took example from the Hunnic Wars. Belisarius implemented the Bucalari, a heavy cavalry unit with lances and composite bows. This made them great at close quarter combat as well as long range distances just like the Huns. Their deadliness made the Roman Empire a force to be reckoned with. Belisarius was married to a woman named Antonina who had just as much of an interesting role in this story as Theodora. In fact she has a very similar background. She was already divorced, was very beautiful, and originally an actress as well. She followed Belisarius on campaign into Italy, and she was also very close friends with Theodora. Justinian's other close friend and ally in the empire was John the Cappadocian. He was a first-rate bureaucrat. Justinian appointed him to Praetorian Prefect, which put him in control of taxes and finance. He is famous for his new tax reforms that closed a lot of tax loops the rich were taken advantage of, which allowed Justinian to commission his great construction projects. John was known for his gluttony and debauchery, but was also a remarkable administrator. Because he was a tax man, he was deeply hated by the establishment and had come head to head with Theodora on many issues. Another of Justinian's generals was a famous Armenian eunuch named Narcisse. He was at least 10 years older than Justinian and Belisarius and was a trusted general who often took over for Belisarius in many campaigns, especially in the city of Rome after taking it back from the Ostrogoths. If you want to think of a great analogy of Narcisse, think of the eunuch general in Game of Thrones, Grey Worm. Justinian spent his first years in power working on the Roman law. He appointed ten scholars to the task and created what is known as Justinian's Law in 13 months. Roman law was very important to legitimacy, so much so that even the Germanic tribes who conquered the Western Empire had adopted Roman law into their courts. Justinian's Law was a very impressive feat that the Romans desperately needed. The current Roman law was a series of edicts that had been issued by Roman emperors over the centuries, and many of them contradicted each other. This made it extremely difficult to achieve anything in the courts. The scholars working on Justinian's law gathered all of the imperial edicts from the time of Emperor Hadrian in 117 until the present, 
including the emperors who persecuted the Christians, such as Diocletian. Every edict and legal decision was separated into categories and then in chronological order. Everything that was obsolete or contradicted itself was removed. Words were changed, added, or removed to make sure the laws were understandable to all. In 529, Justinian revealed his new code of law to the Roman Empire and had copies sent to all of the provinces. He declared that the canons from the four ecumenical councils were now as valid as the Roman imperial law. In his first five years of office, Justinian cracked down on all citizens who did not practice Orthodox Christianity. Apostates were put to death. Those making sacrifices were to be put to death. Everyone had to be baptized, whether they wanted to or not. Pagans were forbidden from teaching and speaking in public. He targeted heretics, which included many different brands of Christianity, all the way to homosexuals and pagans. Jews were considered to be heretics too, but they didn't lose any civil rights. However, they were forbidden from preaching out loud and converting new members. Because Jews were in the Bible, it was important to allow them to exist among them. In 529, there was an inquisition where people were publicly executed, including ministers in high office. As an example of his anti-pagan edict, Justinian shut down the academy in Athens and confiscated their gold. Samaritans in Palestine were persecuted, their temples destroyed, leading to a bloody uprising that was violently suppressed. Constantine had set out to unify the empire under a single religion, but Justinian went way further in pushing for a single, imperial, unified religion. Amid all of this religious purging from the capital, the Monophysites were not declared as heretics. So long as they prophesied their belief in private, never forgetting Theodora's upbringing, they closed brothels and created safe houses for prostitutes. They passed laws that prohibited forced prostitution, outlawed the execution of women for adultery, and guaranteed rights for divorced women. All of this was due to Theodora's influence. Justinian and Theodora began the process of uniting the Orthodox Christians and the Monophysite Christians in the East. The entire empire knew they both had different beliefs and were working together to bring each other sect of Christianity together. And this helped establish good relations with both Rome in the West and still main control over the eastern provinces of the empire. Justinian also inherited a military conflict on a Syrian border that his uncle Justin had been fighting for several years. Relations between the Persians and the Romans remained hostile after the fall of the Hunnic Empire. And despite being involved in direct warfare, they struggled to take control of certain areas to control the spice trade. In 525, the Romans led an army into Yemen to take control of Himyar, an important trading city importing goods from India and China. This was a major economically based conflict, but the Romans used the excuse of protecting Christians in Yemen as an excuse to move his troops into the region. The Persian Empire then moved their troops into the boundaries of Roman territory, which triggered a cold war between the two greatest empires in the region. In the north, the Romans recruited Huns to fight in their wars. And in the south, they recruited Arabs. This Cold War was a ticking time bomb before the two superpowers were going to come face to face in a hot war. The Persians decided to attack the Romans in 530, and Justinian sent Belisarius to fight against the Persians in Mesopotamia. Two major battles were fought between the empires one being won by the Romans and the other by the Persians. After the leader of the Persians died, Justinian settled for peace with the new ruler, putting a temporary end to the war on the Syrian front of the Roman Empire. Justinian's harsh tax collection needed to finance the wars and large construction projects started to make the population angry. His harsh religious persecutions created a toxic environment. Justinian appointed to power the most efficient advisors, despite them being very unpopular. 
John Cappadocia was one of them and led the coalition of scholars who created the Justinian Law Code. There were many taxes created by John of Cappadocia that targeted the rich specifically. Men caught bribing tax collectors were punished. This led to a crisis that nearly cost him his throne at the very beginning of his rule. Despite his unpopularity in the capital, Justinian had achieved quite a lot in his first few years. Christian kingdoms stretching from the Red Sea to the Black Sea were all allied together, and the Sassanids, the Persians, had just signed the Eternal Peace Treaty, ending conflict on his eastern borders. New churches and other buildings were being constructed in every province, while new laws governed the empire. His empire was functioning with extreme efficiency due to the newly appointed officers. All of this was just the beginning. His plan from the very beginning was to reconquer the Western Empire and bring the rest of Europe back into a single Roman Empire. This wasn't that far-fetched of an idea. There were many people still alive during this period who were alive when the Empire was still complete. The rage in the population of Constantinople ranged from peasants to noblemen and had reached a breaking point. Many of the aristocracy were angry that their wealth was being taxed and that their court cases were being lost due to the new legal code. They all remembered a time before Justinian and his uncle, only 14 years before when they could get away with whatever they wanted under Emperor Anastasius. He also managed to anger both the Greens and the Blues chariot racing factions within Constantinople which could best be described as an ancient times version of the Hell's Angels. In January of 532, the New Year chariot races had begun, and in the second week of the tournaments, a riot broke out in the stands between the Greens and the Blues. Justinian sent guards to deal with the rioters. The riot spilled out into the streets, and several members of the Greens and Blues were apprehended and hung in public. Five of the men died on the rope, while two fell to the ground when their ropes broke. They managed to pick themselves up and run away and hide in a monastery where they claimed sanctuary. The imperial guards followed and waited outside of the church to arrest them. One of them was a blue and the other was a green. Now the guards honored the church's law of sanctuary due to their strict religious beliefs. But back in the Hippodrome... Now, Hippodrome is Latin, which literally translates into horse track. Justinian sat in his box watching the final races when the crowd started praying for Emperor Justinian to go lenient on the two prisoners hiding in the church. Unfortunately, Justinian ignored their pleas. And as the races began, the blues and the greens started chanting in unison, Nika, Nika, Nika which translates into victory. Now the whole stadium chanting this at once, staring and pointing their finger at him, spooked him. And Justinian retired from his personal box that overlooked the stadium and returned to his palace. The crowd started rioting in the streets and attacked the palace gates. They burned it to the ground and those fires spread and caught fire to both the Hagia Sophia which was the city's state cathedral, and the Senate building, burning them both to the ground. Justinian failed to recognize this unity of the Greens and Blues as more than just a typical riot in Constantinople, and ordered the tournament resumed the next day. When the crowds filled the stadium, they waited to hear if Justinian had given in to any of their demands, and when he did not, they set fire to the north end of the stadium. Justinian realized the danger and sent his army in to deal with the rioters. The rioters demanded new administrators be appointed, and Justinian immediately gave in to their demands, but the rioters did not stop there. They demanded Justinian step down as emperor, and Anastasius' nephew take his place. Constantinople was now in full revolt, and Emperor Justinian's reign looked like it was about to come to an end. Three days went by with most of the city being burnt to the ground. Seeing the seriousness of the situation, Justinian decided it was time to address the crowds in the Hippodrome and give in to some of their demands. 
It was only two emperors ago when Anastasius went before the riding people of the Hippodrome and offered to give up his crown for the good of the kingdom. His act of humility pleased the crowds, and they let him keep it. When Justinian did this, the crowds of thousands of people booed him and chanted the name of Hypatius, Anastasius' nephew. They ran to Hypatius' house and carried him to the Hippodrome, where they crowned him emperor in front of Justinian and Theodora. The crowds were out of control, and there was nothing Justinian could do about it. Justinian's advisors agreed to a swift retreat to the harbor was the best idea. They would hide out on an island in the Aegean and live in retirement, filthy rich for the rest of their lives. Everyone was in agreement when Theodora stopped them. She told Justinian that she did not suffer through the life of a prostitute and work her way up to the empress just to give it all up now. After ruling over the empire, there was no place left to go. She is rumored to have said that the purple would make an excellent funeral garb. Moved by his wife's sentiments, Justinian agreed to stay and take control of the city. He sent his trusted general with large sums of gold to the leaders of the Blues and convinced them to meet in the Hippodrome. Over 30,000 men gathered on the floor of the racetrack and waited for the emperor to show up and hand over his crown. Instead, the gates to the Hippodrome were quietly sealed, and a row of heavily armed soldiers formed a line at both ends of the stadium. Led by Belisarius, the soldiers began methodically cutting down everyone in their way. In a matter of minutes, the soldiers marched from one end of the floor to the other and butchered all 30,000 men. The stadium floor was filled with blood and chopped up bodies. Justinian then executed the nephew of Anastasius, and just like that, all of his enemies were dead. The capital city of the Eastern Roman Empire was completely burned to the ground, and Justinian was there, ready to rebuild it from the ground up in the exact way he always envisioned. No one was left to challenge him on anything ever again. Within 40 days of the destruction of the Hagia Sophia, the first cornerstone was placed for the new church. Justinian lowered taxes and loosened certain laws to give something to the people. Many senators were stripped of their lands and banished from the capital, while the generals who helped him were promoted. The Nica riots was a defining moment for Justinian, as it solidified his power as the Roman emperor. With Justinian's eastern frontier secured and his political enemies dead or exiled, it was his time to reunite the Roman Empire as a whole. Justinian had allies everywhere, and one of them was in the Germanic Vandal Kingdom of North Africa. To understand the North African Germanic Kingdom, we must follow the Vandals' footsteps through the Great Migration Period. This is just a brief summarization off of Wikipedia. The Vandals are thought to have originally migrated out of Scandinavia around mid-3rd century BC and settled into northern Poland, and by the late 2nd century BC had made it to the south of Poland. As they migrated south, they came into contact with the Roman Empire, and in the 2nd century CE, they were fighting the Romans. In 271, the Roman Emperor Aurelian signed a treaty with Vandals, keeping them on the other side of the Danube River. The Vandals fought against the Goths in many wars, and in 330, Emperor Constantine granted them lands along the Danube River. It is around this time that Christianity spread to the Vandals, and they converted to Arianism. In 401, the Huns invaded and triggered the Great Migration. In 406, they migrated west until they came into contact with the Franks, another Germanic tribe. A terrible battle ensued between the Vandals and the Franks, which took the lives of over 20,000 Vandals. After defeating the Franks, they crossed into Gaul and raided the Roman province as far south as Aquitaine. In 409, they crossed the Pyrenees Mountains into Spain. And in 429, the Vandals crossed over the Pillars of Hercules from Spain to Africa. In 430 CE, the, the Vandals had set up their new kingdom in North Africa, they tried to invade the Italian peninsula through Sicily, but were ultimately kept to the North African provinces of the Roman Empire. 
When the Western Roman Empire fell in 476, the Vandals ruled North Africa from Libya to Spain. They were Aryan Christians and brutally persecuted the Orthodox Christians who lived there. For over 100 years, the Germans had occupied Roman provinces in North Africa and took the city of Carthage as their new capital. While the Vandals were able to defeat the Romans, they struggled to deal with the local Berbers. The Vandal king from 523 to 530 CE was very tolerant towards the Roman Orthodox Christians and had a good relationship with Justinian, but when he died, it gave Justinian a reason to invade North Africa. Belisarius landed in North Africa with an army of 10,000 soldiers. The Romans fought the Vandals at Carthage and easily overthrew them with the help of the local Catholics who had been persecuted by the Aryan Vandal occupiers. The Vandals left Belisarius with the Berber conflict, which the Romans were never fully able to take control of. However, Belisarius now added all of North Africa back to the Roman Empire. From this point forward, the Vandals had been wiped out of history. With this conquest, Belisarius threw himself a tribute like they did in classical Roman times, which really propped up Belisarius in the political stage. Justinian definitely did not like the prestige his general was getting over him, which I think led to the ultimate failure of Justinian being able to fully reunite the old Roman Empire. In 535, with only one way for Belisarius to go, he invaded Sicily, which fell almost immediately. And from there he moved into Naples, where they faced their first major resistance from the Ostrogothic army. The Romans under Belisarius besieged the city for 20 days before some 600 soldiers managed to sneak through an aqueduct and took the city. In 536, after the failures in Naples, the Ostrogothic king Theodahad was assassinated and a new king, Vitigus, came to rule the Ostrogoths. As soon as he came to power, he raised a large army outside of his capital at Ravenna and prepared to march south to meet the Romans in battle. At the same time, Belisarius marched his army north, and the citizens of the Eternal City opened the gates and welcomed Belisarius as liberators. As the Roman soldiers entered the gates in one end of the city, and any Ostrogoths living in Rome ran out the other side in fear for their lives. For the first time in over 60 years, Rome was once again reunited with the empire, which was a huge boost for Justinian's popularity back home. Knowing that the Ostrogoths would return quickly with their new army, Belisarius stockpiled the food supply and refortified the city walls. In the summer of 536, a mysterious cloud appeared over the Mediterranean basin. The sun gave forth its light without brightness, wrote the Byzantine historian Procopius. And it seemed exceedingly like the sun in eclipse, for the beams it shed were not clear. Scientists today attribute this event as the mass eruption of a volcano, probably far away in the northern hemisphere, that caused an unusually cold summer. In 537, the Ostrogothic army marched on Rome and camped on the other side of the river. It just so happened that Belisarius was out scouting when he saw one of his parties up ahead come running back to the Roman defenses. They ambushed Belisarius, and he even got into a fight with the Ostrogoths before retreating back to the Roman walls. However, the guards were frightened of the approaching Goths, and they refused to open the gate for Belisarius and his scouting party. Seeing that there was no getting in, and the, and the Goths chasing them were not properly organized, he decided to turn around with his soldiers and charge the attacking Goths. This move surprised the Goths, who were full running after him, and most of them were cut down before they turned back and ran towards the main Gothic army. Seeing that everything outside of the gates was now calm, the guards opened them up for Belisarius to enter. Viticus's Gothic army set up several camps far away from the walls and surrounded the city. He had over 20,000 men and immediately started constructing siege towers so he could storm the Roman walls. As oxen dragged the siege towers closer to the city, Gothic soldiers started to fill the moat with rocks and dirt, 
giving the siege towers a direct path to the city walls. However, the Romans concentrated all of their arrows on the oxen, killing them and preventing the siege towers from getting any closer. After the siege towers failed, the Ostrogoths sent two armies back to the Roman city on opposite sides of the wall, both concentrating on weaker sections. At one point, the Goths got so close to the walls that Romans started breaking apart statues to drop them on them. On the other side of the city, the Goths climbed over the walls and raided into the city, but they were quickly killed by the defending Romans. Seeing the Goths were distracted, Belisarius opened up the main gate and had his cavalry charge the attackers from the side. He killed many of them, driving the rest away from the city walls. Having momentary control of the grounds around the city, his cavalry galloped around Rome, setting fire to all of the siege towers that were abandoned from the Ostrogoths. Seeing his only opportunity to evacuate the women and children, Belisarius sent the citizens on rafts down the river Tiber and away to safety, while all able-bodied men were drafted to defend the city. These extra recruits allow Belisarius to occupy every station along the walls, as well as lengthen his food supply. Before the Goths were able to launch another attack, 1,600 cavalry reinforcements arrived in the city to help Belisarius. They were sent out in the fields beyond the city walls and peppered the Gothic camps with arrows, killing many and disorganizing the rest. The quick raids and retreats killed hundreds of Gothic soldiers and allowed for most of the Roman cavalry to dart back to the safety of the walls whenever a strong force retaliated. Frustrated with the harassment from Belisarius, the Goths sent a cavalry charge of 500 men to attack the city, only to have them surrounded by over 1,000 Roman cavalry units and killed to the last man. At this point, the Roman cavalry had adopted the Hunnic style of equipping your cavalry with archers, while the Gothic cavalry were charging with lances. The situation was quickly deteriorating for the Goths. Seeing the battle swing in his favor, Belisarius decided to muster his entire army and march them out of the gates to finish off the Gothic army once and for all. Vitigus still outnumbered the Romans and his men charged the Romans pushing their line back. This proved to be a disaster for Belisarius as his men were quickly overpowered and forced to flee back to the Roman walls, suffering heavy casualties. The failure of his initial assault taught Belisarius a lesson and he never attempted a full-scale charge like that again. Instead, he returned to a strategy of sending small raiding detachments out to harass and pick off any stragglers from the Gothic camps. Because the Goths were not able to completely surround the Roman city, they were never able to cut off supplies or reinforcements, and the Romans continued to bolster their power and food supply while the Goths started to grow hungry and suffer from dysentery. The siege continued for several more months. In 538, the Goths finally had enough, and the king ordered a complete retreat. However, the army had to cross the river in order to get away from the city, and Belisarius watched as the giant army funneled across the, the narrow bridge. When it was obvious that half of the army had made the crossing, Belisarius ordered a full charge. He and his cavalry charged the Ostrogoths and killed every single soldier that was trapped on his side of the river. The Eternal City was now officially secure and back in Roman hands. In 539, Belisarius was reinforced with more troops from Constantinople that were led by the commander and eunuch Narses. And together they marched up the coast of Italy, liberating cities from the Ostrogoths. However, infighting broke out between Narses and Belisarius as to who was actually in command. When the city of Milan was besieged by Franks, they sent for help to Belisarius, who commanded his officer to go to the rescue. However, the officer refused, stating that he only received orders from Narses. Between the time it took for Narses to give the exact same order, Milan fell to the Franks and was sacked burning everything to the ground. 
The incident forced Belisarius to send a letter to Justinian, demanding that Narses be recalled at once. The emperor listened to his commander and recalled Narses back to Constantinople. With command now firmly in his control, Belisarius began to organize his forces and prepare to attack the Goths in their capital of Ravenna. He marched north and made it to Ravenna by autumn of that year, and to his luck he arrived just in time to intercept the large grain shipment sent to supply the Goths. And to make matters even better for Belisarius, the grain storages inside the Gothic capital caught fire. With no food and a very well-fed, strong army outside of the gates, the Ostrogothic king Vitigus surrendered. At one point even offered to proclaim Belisarius the emperor in the Western Roman Empire. But he refused and imprisoned his king. Belisarius was loyal to Justinian. In 540, Belisarius lowered his ships with the treasury of Ravenna and sailed back to Justinian to whom he was truly loyal. Italy was now under Roman control. However, there were still Ostrogothic armies roaming the countryside without a leader that would not make holding onto the peninsula easy for the Romans. The most important fact to take away from this situation is that Justinian had made extremely impressive moves against the German tribes that conquered the Western Roman Empire. He also unified the empire under a common law and did his best to amalgamate the Christians within the empire to a unified belief. Everything was looking up for Justinian. In fact, if you were a hundred-year-old citizen of Constantinople who was born during the Roman Empire, you might believe that everything was about to return to normal. And as someone looking at history unfolding on a map, you would see that the Roman Empire was on its way to recovery. Justinian did everything right and can't be blamed for what was about to happen. Part of me believes that Justinian would have reunited the entire Roman Empire, plus more territory, had the plague not struck. In 539 or 540, another volcano erupted. It spewed 10% more aerosols into the atmosphere than the huge eruption of Tambora in Indonesia in the year 1815, which caused the infamous year without a summer. It is also suggested that this volcanic eruption could have also led to the demise of the Mayan civilization. According to the Greenland Central Temperature Chart, the climate was already getting colder. Despite a warming trend over the last couple centuries that almost saw the revival of the Roman Empire, now, without summer, and a sky full of ash and soot, the world was about to plunge even colder dropping lower than the earth had seen in over 8,000 years. Well, that's it for today. Join us next time on the history of modern Greece. See you next time. Stay safe and stay awesome.